you can cool new new language features, cool new programs that we could write with our, our new language features. So I thought just for a change of pace, I would talk about old language features and old programs we could write with them. In particular, I want to talk about type classes, right? So, and I want to talk about sort of how we should think about how we should understand sort of programs written using type classes and, and maybe programs written using some old extensions to type classes. And so a bunch of you are probably thinking, great, this talk's going to be very short. We're going to have a short, we're going to have a long break because we already know how to think about programs with type classes. We think about them by sort of translations to an explicitly typed, set to explicitly typed um, language, right? So if we have sort of the constant function, I'm not going to do that. We have the constant function over there that's got sort of, you know, behaves the way the constant function does. We can sort of, we have this sort of an, in a, a Haskell sort of language and sort of implicitly polymorphic. We can translate this to an explicitly typed, explicitly polymorphic syntax like that over here. We have sort of explicit type abstraction and then sort of type annotation, right? Um, and so the question is, is this sort of the only interpretation of the sort of implicitly typed thing over here? Sort of, is, is this sort of precisely the interpretation that we should have? And, and so I'm going to sort of be pedantic and bring up this paper that somebody wrote in which he said sort of like, you know, when he's sort of introducing this idea of these sort of uh, implicit ML style polymorphism, the, a type signature like this means that the, any occurrence of map within the scope of this declaration must be assigned some substitution mm. instance of this type. Right, so rather than being defined in terms of explicit abstraction, type abstraction application, we have this notion of substitution instances, right? And so we think about that a bit, and we can say this is exactly the same trans this is has exactly the same type for const, right? Everything that's a substitution instance of the first thing, A to B to A, is also going to be a substitution instance of the second thing, B to A to B. Right? But on the other hand, if we sort of apply the same sort of naive translation to that, we're going to get a very different term in our explicitly typed language, right? So now the type is different, and in particular, the, the uh, sort of use of these, these types after the type applications are different, right? So the point is, given that we have sort of the same thing in the left-hand column and different things in the right-hand column, why do we think sort of explicitly translation, explicit tra ex bleh, translation of an explicitly typed approach is a good semantic, right? And the answer is that we can relate these things. We can show that this translation is in some sense coherent, right? And so in particular, if we have sort of Mitchell's retyping functions, we can show that not only can we enter, can we uh, interchange these approaches on the left, but uh, sorry, on the right. But anything we could do with one, we could do with the other, right? And we can do exactly the same thing with type classes. So, so here's a, a slightly more complicated term, but not particularly any more interesting. It's sort of to, to comparing pairs for quality. And as we sort of translated a simple parametric polymorphism into an explicitly uh, typed system, we can translate this into a system with explicit uh, dictionary passing, right? So. So we have our, our type abstractions before. Now we're going to take uh, evidence that both the types A and B are in the EAT class, and we're going to use that sort of this, this thing that I've called lowercase EQ as sort of projecting the, the implementation of EAT out of these dictionaries to implement this, uh, this, this quality comparison, right? And, and so I'm going to make exactly the same argument that I did before. First of all, that we should, we should be interpreting these sort of implicit types sort of by generalization and, and instantiation and by restriction on instantiation. And that means that I can construct an equivalent term here where I've sort of flipped the order of the constraints, but other than that, it's the same. These two types are exactly equivalent. But obviously, the, the dictionary passing translation of them isn't equivalent, and there's a typo on the slide that I'll, I'll leave for you to find. But, but the point is that sort of we've taken the dictionaries in opposite order. Um, and again, as with Mitchell's retyping function, we can build sort of conversions that we can show sort of relate these views and sort of establish coherence for these translations. This was originally done by Stephen Blott and then sort of generalized by Mark Jones. So, so the point is we have this great, this great sort of situation. We have an implicitly typed world. We can translate it to a world with explicit types, and we can show that these translations are coherent. So what's my talk about? Well, the point is that in the time since then, there have been various proposals to extend the type class system. So these might be things like functional dependencies or quality constraints, where we're trying to sort of gain some level of knowledge about the instantiation of types, or sort of refining our types with predicates. Or it could be something like overlapping instances or instance chains, where we're sort of uh, we, where the predicates start to give us addition, additional information beyond simple restriction on the, uh, on the, on the type, <coughs> on type instantiation. And when we do this, we're going to sort of lose these coherence properties that made the earlier translations make sense, right? And so the goal, uh, in this talk, I'm going to particularly sort of focus on functional dependencies and overlapping instances. You can extend the arguments to the other things quite, quite naturally. My particular goal is to develop a semantics that has coherence despite these, these class system extensions, right? An approach in which we can still have these class system extensions and we still get coherent translation. You may not like my semantics. I think it's pretty cool. But even if you don't, I think this goal is worth pursuing whatever your semantic approach happens to be. Um, so, so let's talk about functional dependencies, right? So functional dependencies allow us to induce type refinements from class predicates. So, so here's sort of, I think, the first example of functional dependencies. Um, we have a class of collections. I called it alums, the alums of T or U. We, have, we presumably have a bunch of methods, but I only care about insert. So an insert takes an element u and a collection t and gives you back a new collection. 
And here's a function that inserts two elements, x and y, into a collection z. Right? So what's the type of this thing? Well, we just sort of do type inference on this in sort of a, a standard fashion. We'll get this type here where we say given that the elements of t are both u and v, we can insert, we can take a u and a v and insert them into t. But of course what we know from the functional dependency is that the collection type t determines the element type u, right? If the collection type is list of alpha, then the element type is alpha. And so if the elements of t are u and the elements of t are v, then u and v must be the same type, right? And so we can also put this type for f. And sort of by this notion of saying like, well, what these types really refer to is sort of their, their restrictions on the instantiations. These are exactly the same. Every satisfying instantiation of the first type is a satisfying instantiation of the second type, and vice versa. Every set of, right. But again, if we sort of, if we translate these into sort of an explicitly uh, typed system, this first thing, right, we have three type variables, t, u, and v. We have some dictionaries, we have a type. And the second thing, we have two type variables, t and u. We have a dictionary, and we have a type. And clearly, we can use the first thing to implement the second thing, right? The second thing is a restriction of the first thing. But the, same, the, the opposite doesn't apply, right? If all we have is an implementation of the first thing, there's no way to construct an implementation of the second thing. And you're saying, we solved that problem, right? This is precisely what we introduced system FC to solve. Why are you still talking, right? But the point is that this is just one instance of a larger problem. So, so we can do the same thing. I mean, yeah, that, what I said. So we can do the same thing with sort of overlapping instances. So again, here's sort of, I think, a very early example of overlapping instances. So the show class in Haskell has um, built into a sort of a cunning trick to show lists, right? We want to be able to show, or it's a cunning trick to show strings. We want to be able to show strings in sort of the surface syntax where they have quotation marks around them. We want to show everything else as square brackets with commas. And so there's a trick where there's this function called show list built into show that handles that. Maybe we don't want to do it that way. Maybe that seems a bit ad hoc. We want to just be able to sort of provide sometimes more specific instances to handle specific subcases and then have sort of general instances. So that's what we can sort of do with overlapping instances. Um, so here we have sort of a special instance for show on characters and a general instance for show on lists of T, right? Um, and, and here's a, a completely non-contrived example function which I take sort of a non-empty list and show the head and tail separately. So what's the type of my example here? Well, again, we need to be able to show the head of the list, that's show t. We need to be able to show the tail, that's show list of t. And if we can do that, then we can take a list of t and turn it into two strings. Right? Now, it's worth pointing out, these constraints are, in fact, if viewed as constraints on type instantiation. On one of these is unnecessary. right? Because if we can show t, every time that we can show t, we can show a list of t. Right? So if I just look at this as sort of what are the ground instances that satisfy these predicates, this is a precisely equivalent type. Right? But on the other hand, if I do the translation of these things, I have a problem. Here I have two dictionaries, and I need two dictionaries because I don't know if showing the element type and showing the list, if showing the list type is built out of showing the element type or if it's a special case for a list of characters. But on the other hand, translating this bottom type, I only have the dictionary for showing the element type, right? So now I can no longer figure out whether I was actually supposed to be using the special instance for a list of characters or whether I'm supposed to be using generic instance. So again, we have equivalent types on the left, we have unequivalent translations on the right. So what's my idea about this? Well, it's not really my idea, but what's the idea I'm proposing to deal with this? And that's to sort of go back to that initial idea that said, well, what this polymorphic type is telling us is the substitution is, is that this thing can be used in any substitution instance of that type, right? So I'll start, down by, start out by writing down the substitution instances. There are a lot of them, so forgive me for not putting them all on the slide. But here's sort of some representative examples. Um, and of course, this is sort of things where I've instantiated A to int. I could also instantiate A to bool. We could do similar things that I didn't write down. Uh, and then what I want to do is at each of these ground types, I want to sort of interpret the behavior of this thing, right? We say we can use it in any ground type, so let's write down what it does in each ground type, right? And I can do that sort of very easily by simply writing it down inside interpretation brackets. But this is cheating, right? What do these interpretation brackets mean? Well, I'm going to suggest that we view this, we view each of these, or right? we know these are ground types, right? All the types are sort of fully determined. We can view these in the simply type lambda calculus. And these interpretation brackets can simply be any model of the simply type lambda calculus that you like. I'm kind of simple, so I like type frames. Um, so, but the point is, we have these sort of simply type terms. We've figured out all the types in them. We've done sort of, you know, we have, we have typing derivations. And now we interpret them in a suitable semantics for the simply type lambda calculus. And what does that mean we've got as the semantics of this polymorphic thing? Well, it means we have a map from ground instances to the interpretation of those ground instances in some type frame. Right? Um, so this is not my idea. This was originally developed, proposed by Atsushi Ohori, uh, again, a quarter century ago. Um, it was extended to polymorphic recursion by Bill Harrison in 2005. Um, and, and I'm going to be sort of looking at its application to, to overloading. But before I talk about overloading, let's talk about a few sort of nice properties of this approach to modeling polymorphism. Um, so here's another type for the constant function, right? 
exactly the same term, just a more specific type. Right? And I can do the same thing I did on the previous slide. I can build a list of ground instances on the left. I can build a collection of, of interpretations on the right. And now we can say, how does, the semantic, how does this semantics relate to the semantics we built for the, fully, for, the, for the principal type? And well, the answer is we can see each of these lines appears at a corresponding place in the, in the, the, the semantics at its, at, its, at its principal type. Each of the implementations matches up. So we have a very nice subset relationship. Right? So we have a relationship on types. The one on the right is a sort of substitution instance of the one on the left, and we have a direct relationship between the semantics. The one on the right is a subset of the one on the left. Now, I, obviously, we could take some approach like Mitchell's retyping functions and do the same transformation in explicitly typed syntax, and we sort of invent these terms and show that the terms didn't affect the semantics and such. Here, the, here the, the relationship is very direct. Right now, let's come, come up with perhaps a slightly more interesting way to instantiate the constant functions type. So I'm going to leave the, the sort of A parameter free. But, but, pick the, but for, stick the B parameter to be bold, right? And so again, I can sort of write down a list of types, a list of implementations, and again, I can compare this to the semantics of the principal type. And again, we can see that each of these sort of lines is going to show up in the left-hand column on the left side, and each implementation is going to match. So again, whether we're sort of instantiating the first parameter or the second parameter, however we've gone about constructing the substitution instance, we're going to have the same result, that the semantics of sort of a more specific instance is a subset of the, of the semantics of a more general instance. Right? Okay. So, wow, I'm talking really fast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's talk about overloading. Um, so, so here's an overloaded function. It's the same one I talked about before. And if we think about this from sort of a dictionary passing approach, we expect there to be something interesting going on here, right? We're sort of comparing A's and B's for, oh, I should probably say eek, but you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. We're comparing A's and B's for equality, and you know, we expect something to happen with, with the dictionaries. Right? So again, we can construct a list of, of the ground instances of this type. And already, you might be feeling a bit queasy about this. You're saying, well, this type has constraints in it. What happened to those constraints? Why are you just writing the same kind of list of type you've been writing to, to this point? And again, the thing is, we're just thinking of this as constraints on the instantiation. right? So maybe I have a gut instinct that says that you know, int arrow int is never going to show up as one of the, uh, one of the, the elements of this tuple. Right? In Haskell, we can't actually verify that. Somebody might come along at some point and add silly instances of E. But at this point, we're not interested in that. We're just saying, what are the ground instances for which we can satisfy the predicates? And again, I'm just going to stick interpretation brackets around the terms and pretend that I've said something. And at this point, again, you should be sort of slightly suspicious because you should say, well, eh, what's that mean? Right? What, what does it mean to have this sort of equality operator inside your interpretation brackets? And I could try to cheat, and I could say, well, I have some sort of substitution property, and clearly I have some sort of primitive implementations of equality for int and bool. But this is sort of missing the point, right? How did I get from here to here? And this makes sort of a, 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 sort of a side point about this approach, which I think is kind of interesting, that this term is actually not terribly interesting in the semantics. The interesting question is, how do we get from the class method itself to the implementation of the class method? And so that's what I want to talk about on the next slide. Let's talk about the eek class, right? So. <clears throat> So I've written down a couple of instances of E, uh, one for int, one for bool, one for lists. I've picked a bizarre set of primitives. Obviously, you really want to implement these things as compiler and trend. But whatever, this lets me write some instances on a slide. And now what I'm going to do is, is sort of just apply this sort of approach to compute the semantics of each of these method definitions, right? So the monomorphic ones aren't terribly interesting because they only have one ground instance. So we get sort of exactly the behavior you'd expect. And again, I'm going to interpret, assume that we can interpret is 0 and, and XOR in whatever our model of the simply type lambda calculus is. Um, the one for lists is a little more interesting in the sense that there are a bunch of ground instances of this type, and they're going to have different implementations over here depending on the ground instances uh, on, the, on the implementation here. Now, to actually do this fully formally, you need to talk about a sequence of approximations and a continuous partial order, and I encourage you to read the paper to do that. But so now we have the, the, the sort of models of each of these methods independently. And the point I want to make, the ground instances of this thing, which I'm going to circle in like as many red things as I can find, are the ground instances of this type here, which is the specific instance of equality in this, the, the specific you know, substitution instance of the equality method in this class instance, right? The list of t, the list of t to pool. But now suppose I just take these tables and stick union signs between them, right? I can do this, these are just maps. And now I have this big table, right? It's got sort of my, my ground instances, it's got my polymorphic instances in here. And now the question is, what's the What's, what's this thing I'm drawing circles around? And the point is, this is now the ground instances of the general type of the equality predicate, right? Any time that I can prove e t, the e t to t to bool shows up in this list. So by simply taking the union 
of the semantics of the, of the individual instances, I've gone to the semantics of the class method as a whole. Now, if you take this and plug it into what I did with my equality for tuples, you'll see that the sort of entries in this table precisely match up with the implementations that I wanted for equality on tuples. Right, so this is sort of the point. Um, I want to show you one more example. Um, I've written two functions, right? I've written the identity function. On the left is the way normal people would write the identity function, it takes x to x. On the right is the way I would write the identity function, where I'm going to sort of introduce a type class and then introduce some instances. So I have a type class, and I have this function head 2 of t. And I'm going to do something particularly silly in the case of functions, right, where sort of rather than just sort of mapping the function to itself, I map the function to itself, pre and post composed with identity. And these are overlapping instances, which, you know, we know about overlapping instances. And the question I'm going to ask is, do these define the same function? Is id1 in some sense the same as id2? Right? And my claim is that any time you use id1, you could substitute id2, and you wouldn't be able to distinguish the results of your program. Somebody will say something about type signatures. Don't say that. But any time you could sort of use id1, you could substitute id2, and vice versa. They do the same thing at every ground instance. <coughs> that seems to me like they should be the same, idea, the same function. So can, in this approach, can we show that they're the same function? Um, except I don't want to talk about overlapping instances, because overlapping instances are hard. So I'm going to sort of arbitrarily restrict my domain of types. Um, you can do much better than this in sort of a more general setting, but it requires a whole bunch of setup about what overlapping instances mean. So let's assume that our types are just functions and integers. And so now my instances are for functions and integers, and that covers all of my types. Right? So we can start out by defining the semantics of the thing on the left. It's not terribly surprising. And then we can go on and try to define the semantics of the thing on the right. Right? So we have its behavior at ints. It's the identity function. We can start defining its behavior for, for, for sort of the for functions. So if it's int, 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 then I'm going to sort of you know, inline this definition here, and so forth, at, at more types. And now the question is, what's really going on here? Well, I know that this id2 is the one at int, int. I know that this id2 is the one at int, int. And so I'm going to sort of assume substitution. And that that's equal to the interpretation of that thing. And finally, I'm going to assume eta rules, and so that's equivalent to the interpretation of that. Right? I can do the same thing for the subsequent lines. And now, if I write this side by side with the thing that I said was the semantics of the, the term on the left, you can see that they line up precisely. So in this approach, we do get exactly the same semantics, whether we've chosen to define something sensibly or whether we've chosen to define something sort of asensibly. <laughs> so I will set this out by talking about functional dependencies. And some of you may have noticed a distinct absence of functional dependencies in the second half of the talk. The good news is I showed you the model for functional dependencies. It's exactly the same as the model for anything else. We don't extend the model at all. In the paper, oops, that's not the right button. In the paper, I sort of go into a bit about functional dependencies, and particularly and sort of give a type rule that sort of allows you to use functional dependencies to swap types around and show that sort of the semantics preserves all the expected type equalities and all the expected term equalities go into a judgmental presentation of equality, and there are a whole bunch of uh, sort of soundness and coherence properties that I state and write a bunch of cases of proofs for. Um, special thanks are due to my advisor, Mark Jones, Jim Hook, who's actually responsible for the identity example, and Caitlin Cotta. Um, and I am now happy to turn your questions into answers. <laughs> I mean, it's really up to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this thing you did with the type reminds me very much about alpha interpretation and concretization yep. of your of your types into some ground types. So, could you elaborate a bit? What's the difference? What's the relation? Um, no, but I should be able to. Uh, so, so yes, this does sort of correspond to an implementation in which you sort of treat everything by specialization. Um, but I think there are sort of there are, there are likely to be sort of a bunch of issues that arise when you're trying to talk about a concrete implementation, uh, like these tables that I've written down are likely to be large, uh, but those aren't necessarily present in sort of a more abstract set. So it seems to me that one could go back to the sort of retyping function stuff approach, and at least extend that to handle functional dependencies if. Functional dependencies were explicitly representative of evidence in the, uh, in you could call the language system. that you're translating into. Call okay. it system FC. Sorry? I said I think you'd call that system FC, but go ahead. So, well, this is the thing. So, system FC doesn't currently do that, or at least GFC doesn't currently do this and doesn't use system FC to do that. And if it did, then this kind of retyping function approach would become practical again. 
So do you think that direction of research is worth pursuing, or is this is this enough uh, to deal um, with these kind of issues? Yeah. So so I think um, I think having coherent semantics is a good goal, regardless, right? So. So I guess I would claim that the approach I'm proposing here is it's going to be limited in some ways, but it makes a lot of these questions very easy to answer. Um, on the other hand, I think if you take an approach where you're simply elaborating your, your uh, explicitly typed language, so long as you do keep ensuring that you have coherence, I'm perfectly happy with that. So in some sense, that, that's the, 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 the talk comes in those two parts. So um, we've got a question about the, when you had this list and stance on the, the others. Yeah. So you seem to sort of substitute in things. I mean, do, is, is the semantics only defined for the full program? You can't skip the semantics for the in list instance by itself. I mean, you have the int and, and far and, and this or something like that. Um, also there, I mean. Yeah, I guess I was trying to get to the exact slide you're talking about, sorry. Um, so at any point, you know, sort of for any collection of modules, you can build the semantics of the class methods. Right, and so like you mentioned something about substitution, like I say, if you go in the paper, you'll see this is defined by sequence of approximations that gets you to this result in the end. If you extend the program, right, you add new instances, um, you could show, but I haven't, that the semantics of your thing with new instances would be a strict superset of the semantics of the thing without the new instances. So there's a connection between the semantics given the particular set of instances. But no, you can't sort of talk about a particular instance completely in isolation without I mean, I guess you get a, a, a trivial semantics for it. Okay, so, so semantics is really for the, the full set of instance declarations. Yes. Yeah. Right, well, the semantics is really for the methods, which are you know, defined in terms of the particular set of instance declarations. I'm not sure it's sensible to talk about what equals means if you don't talk about what the instances defining equals are. It's a bit strange if you have the semantics for, for one part of the program and the semantics for another part of the program, but one instances and then one other instances. I'm not sure how this composes. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, you have one module with a quality instance and another module with a base instance for boom. Right, so yeah, in that sense, the semantics is for the entire program. <coughs> okay, thank you. I'll thank the speaker again. Have a break of 20 minutes.